welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Hello and welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your home for all things related to helping you on your journey to find an amazing job. Each episode, I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, graduate recruiters and career coaches who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute-ish show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had when I graduated. Hello and welcome to the 126th episode of the UK's number one careers podcast and I've got a very special episode for you today. Joining me back on the show by popular demand is serial entrepreneur and author Michael Tafula, who discusses his book Graduate Entrepreneurship, How to Start Your Business After University. In the show today we discuss why university or just after is such a great time to start a business. And we also bust some of the key myths that might be holding you back from taking the plunge. We cover why it might cost you less than you think to start a business, why it's not about having a great idea, but why you should instead focus on solving people's problems. Finally, we delve into why graduate schemes will be so interested in any companies you do launch and how to make the most of those transferable skills in graduate interviews. No matter what companies you're applying to, and even if you've never thought of starting your own business, this is an episode you won't want to miss. Now, the only link you need to remember from today is graduatejobpodcast.com slash entrepreneurship, where you can find a full transcript and links to everything which we discuss. That's graduatejobpodcast.com slash entrepreneurship. Before we start, a quick message from me. Have you got any interviews or assessment centres coming up? If you have, then make sure you get in touch for some expert interview coaching specifically tailored to the company and the role you're applying to. Competition, as you know, is more intense than ever before and you can't afford to leave anything to chance. You wouldn't have a driving test without having lessons beforehand, so why would you want to go to an assessment centre without getting practice in first? you get one shot to impress. So get in touch with me at graduatejobpodcast.com slash coaching and see how I can help. You'll be glad you did, but be quick though, as I only have a limited number of slots and they are filling up quickly. That's graduatejobpodcast.com slash coaching. Right, with that said, let's jump in to my chat with Michael Tafula. A very warm welcome back to the show, Michael Tafula, who first appeared on the show nearly five years ago, back in episode 11. Michael, welcome back to the Graduate Job Podcast. It's wonderful to be back, James. Thank you so much for having me back on the on, on, on the show. I can't believe it's been that long. It, time has flown by. So listeners, if you've not checked out episode 11, where Michael took us through preca- uh, procrastination and uh, how to overcome it which is a really useful topic especially as we're getting into deep into application territory and you need to all your focus and attention to make sure you're putting in a good application so you definitely go back and listen to that one so michael it's been a busy busy five years for you do you want to fill us in on what you've been up to apart from writing graduate yeah. entrepreneurship which will uh, yeah. which we'll go through today Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite incredible, actually, looking back on, on the last five years and realizing, um, you know, it feels like it's gone by pretty quickly. But actually, you know, there was quite a lot of activity between between, you know, back then and, and, and now. And, and I guess when we last spoke, um, I was just sort of coming off the uh, the uh, the second book that I'd written, Student Procrastination. Uh, shortly after that, I went off to write a third book, which was the uh, uh, the Graduate Entrepreneurship, which we'll you know t- touch on uh, in, in in the podcast. But you know, in the last couple of years, really, I've just been spending as much time learning more about entrepreneurship, um, learning how business works, working within businesses, uh, working for uh, a, a range of uh, funds uh, during that timeline, and you know, ultimately, I've landed off into uh, a career as a venture capitalist. So, you know, someone who goes out to uh, to find uh, amazing, incredible companies that are creating new products, mostly technology products uh, that we can bring to market by uh, providing the capital that those companies need to uh, to grow and and thrive. So we're, it's been a, you know, a great, a great few years, but, you know, I'm sure lots of uh, lots, lots more exciting things ahead and lots more to learn going ahead. 
No, definitely. And, you know, you've got a practical knowledge of entrepreneurship, having founded plenty of small businesses yourself. So, you know, you know what's needed to get something off the ground. So you're well placed to offer advice to uh, to listeners today. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and it's, it's, it's great. I think entrepreneurship is a great um, mindset to have, not just when you're starting a company, but then actually also when you're working within other organizations. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to touch on some of these things later on. But I think one of, one of the most interesting things I've come across is the fact that, you know, you, you, you can be entrepreneurially minded without necessarily having to start a company. Uh, and, and there's various sort of skill sets and, and processes and, and ways of thinking that can really uh, help you uh, be more entrepreneurial in everything that you do. Yeah. And let's jump straight into it then. So why is university or just after university a good time to start your own business? Well, wh- one of the things I actually touch on in, in the book is this idea uh, of having a bit of a graduate advantage. Right. So, you know, there's been a bit of research around how companies, how well companies perform um, and, and how well they uh, uh, go on to do how well they go on to do depending on the quality of the management teams and the quality of the founders that they have and you know having a university degree can provide a number of benefits one of which is network so the people that you meet at university the uh, contacts you make while going to university all these things can actually come in handy when you go off to start a company and you're looking to find the right contacts to help you develop your ideas further or potentially even to find prospects and people that you can actually sell your uh, services too. So, you know, coming right out of university, you come out with a network, usually anyway, uh, that can be quite valuable in, 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 in helping you develop your idea. Um, and also actually it's a pretty, pretty low risk time to actually go out and try something different. Um, you know, you haven't necessarily settled down. You haven't yep. bought a house. Um, you know, you might not have kids yet, for example, and you just have a bit more freedom to actually go out and explore, uh, something that might be a little bit different. Yeah, and these things only get more difficult as you've uh, got mortgages and exactly. kids and uh, things like that down the line. So, yeah, definitely it is a good time. And I, I like to start in the book about how um, businesses started by university graduates on average make 20 percent higher revenue than a business started by a high school dropout. So that was, yeah, it just shows the, the difference that a university education does make when you start the business. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, again, it's not so much about. Um, having a degree per se, but it's about having the right contacts, uh, the right networks, having a bit of knowledge uh, from 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 the the education that you've pursued, or um, having a bit more credibility when you go out to um, to to recruit people, or perhaps to um, to network with organisations that you might be able to sell into if you're starting a, a business to business company. Let's start by thinking about some of the myths, because I'm sure some of the listeners are, you know, at the back of their mind, they've maybe been thinking about oh, maybe I'd like to start a business. But there's there's some things that might be holding them back. So mm. let's maybe you talk in the book about the, the different myths that can hold people back. So let's just uh, explore those a little bit. So the first one is that you need a great idea to start a business. Mm. Tell us why yeah. this might not be the case. Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting one because I think you know, a lot of people are intimidated by entrepreneurship because they think that they have to come up with the perfect idea uh, from the get go. But what's really interesting is that if you look at any any successful business, right, they always start off with a very simple proposition. Um, you know, I've got a very old example here with, uh, I, I guess, you know, we all know Sir Richard Branson is now going off into space and, and, and starting a uh, space tourism company. Um, but when you think about the company that he started, Virgin, right? So it started off as a as a mail order business. So this is very very old school way of um, uh, selling music through the post, right? So someone would send in a check or pay for something and then get uh, a piece of vinyl or uh, a record back then that would be delivered by post. And you know that that was the focus of Virgin Records. Or you know we can think about more uh, more contemporary companies like you know Facebook or Google or TikTok. You know, all these companies start off with a very, very simple idea that eventually grows into something more meaningful and something more substantial. So I think, you know, a lot of people get distracted by this idea of, you know, I need to find the perfect, perfect thing that can start when actually a lot of ideas start off very simply. And then you sort of build on from there. You know, right now we all use Google every day when we're searching for things on the Internet. But actually Google Maps came later on. Uh, that's another aspect of Google. YouTube was acquired later on by Google. Um, Google now is also actually working on self-driving cars and a bunch of other really interesting things. But, you know, the core of the business and the core original DNA of the business was very, very simple. So I think, you know, we kind of have to put that idea aside of 
you know, I have to find the perfect, perfect idea. What you want to do is find a small thing that you can sort of execute on really, really well and build from there. Mm, that's great advice. And um, yeah, comparing where businesses are 30 years down the line versus where they started off is, uh, you know, not a good comparison part, not yeah. a good comparison piece. Just start with, you said, start with a small idea and then you never know where it might grow and meander to and the different directions that you might take along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So another myth that people might have is that entrepreneurs are born, not made. Do you think mm. this is the case? Uh, you know, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, the, you know, there's certainly certain things that some people have innately um, and, you know, they, they might be uh, a little bit more comfortable uh, taking more risks, for example, or they might be uh, a little bit more extroverted so, that, so they can go out there. Uh, and, and, and be very salesy and, and, and network and meet new people. But I think, you know, entrepreneurship is mostly a process uh, and, and any process uh, that can be uh, 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 repeated on a regular basis is a process that can be improved. So, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs were, you know, were, were definitely not born. They, just, they were actually just people that had a, a small idea that grew into something a lot larger and have had to learn along the way on how they can actually be better entrepreneurs. In the industry that I operate in, uh, in, in venture capital, we meet entrepreneurs very early on when they're starting their companies. And, and a lot of times you can see that those entrepreneurs are very passionate about what they're building, but they've got some skill gaps in terms of how they can be better CEOs. And the very best of them take that on and actually they can practice specific skills around management, leadership, um, and they can start to develop those skills as they grow their business. They can also grow along that business and become better CEO. So I definitely think entrepreneurship is something that you can learn, you know, because it's a process uh, and the very best entrepreneurs are always learning. Yep. No, that's a, that's a really good point. And one of the things that maybe entrepreneurs might see differently uh, than average Joe on the street is the idea of risk, which is another one of the myths that entrepreneurs love risk. Do you think you need to be a natural risk taker to uh, to be setting up your own business? So not necessarily, not necessarily at all. I think, you know, what, what, what's very interesting about entrepreneurs and people who are very entrepreneurially minded, um, they, they, they find ways of identifying risks and, and end up and, and they then go on to actually mitigate for those risks. Um, so that's, that's one element of it. The other element of it is that they are typically very confident in their abilities to overcome challenges, mm. but they don't necessarily see risks the same way that other people do. Um, so if you have someone starting a company, for example, in a industry or market that they're not really familiar with, a really good entrepreneur will go out in a particular industry and speak to as many customers as possible uh, because they see that as a way of filling a gap in their knowledge, which other people might necessarily consider to be very risky. So, you know, what's very typical of, of really good entrepreneurs is they uh, they find ways of mitigating those risks such that they're not as um, uh, 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 as scary as, as it might be for other people. Uh, but they also actually have a lot of belief and self-confidence in themselves to go out and mitigate for these risks and find ways of overcoming some of these obstacles. Yep. And what about then building on risk is the commonly referred to stat that nine out of 10 new businesses fail. Do you think yeah. this should be a reason to put people off? Yeah, no, uh, that, that's another sort of curious number that, you know, I always see and, and people mention this a lot. It's, it's sort of a this thing that's very easy to remember and, you know, it's, it's a bit of a sound bite. Nine out of 10 businesses fail. Um, and actually, you know, this this conceals or at least certainly doesn't reveal the nuance of some of these statistics. When I was looking at this, actually, and I was looking at a number of different studies, it turns out that actually about one in six companies uh, fail within the first year. Um, and then if you go over a long enough timeline, even, you know, perhaps even after uh, five or six years or so, you have about 30 percent of the companies who are still operational. So so that that sort of stats that nine out of 10 companies fail, it doesn't really take into account time. You know, are we looking at six months? Are we looking yeah. at one year? Are we looking at 10 years? We're looking at 20 years. Um, and I think it's just a, a, a stat that puts off a lot of people when actually, you know, it's um, not, think, not, not taking into account time. But then also, actually, every business is you know, its own, it's in, it's in its own unique circumstance. Um, there are certain things you can do to improve your prospects. And, you know, I sort of touched on one of those things, you know, if you're going into an industry that you don't really know a lot about, it helps if you can speak to as many people in that industry as possible. And there's a bunch of other things you can do to actually mitigate and minimize uh, your uh, risks of, of failure. Yep. 
And one of the things we'll touch upon later in the interview is just the skills that you're going to learn as an entrepreneur, which are going to be valuable in the job search. But yeah, they might fail. You know, as you said, some businesses fail, but you're going to still learn some amazing things, lots of skills that you just wouldn't learn otherwise. And it's going to be attractive to a recruiter further down the line. One final myth, then the myth of money. How much uh, how true do you think it is that, you know, you need money to start a business? Yeah, so that, that, that's, um, you know, again, going back to the idea of every business is a little bit different and everyone has a very unique circumstance. I think, you know, sometimes there's an impression that you need a whole heap of money to be able to launch something. Uh, but in the industry that I work in, for example, in venture capital, we're investing in technology companies. Uh, there's a lot of tools um, out there that you can use to actually build an idea very, very cheaply and very quickly to test if it works. So, you know, for example, if you are, uh, building a new app, you don't necessarily have to build the whole thing. You could simply put up a, uh, a web page with um, uh, a, a small box asking for people's email addresses and saying, hey, if you're interested in using this app, sign up here and I'll let you know when it's launched. Yeah. You can then build up an inv- invitation list that can validate there's a need for what you're building. So that's one way of you know, starting something and testing it out without spending a lot of money. But of course, if we're looking at traditional businesses, let's say, for example, if you wanted to open a cafe or a restaurant, um, you don't necessarily have to get 30, 40 grand to, uh, to open something substantial. Um, you could start with a food store, for example, right? You could start with a, uh, going to a, a, a food festival and, and having a very small kiosk where you can actually test out um, some of your products with, with early customers. So the principle behind this, uh, 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 the way of overcoming this myth that you need a lot of money is to actually start very small and look at ways in which you can actually test your idea without having to go out and spend uh, a whole heap of money before you get started. No, definitely. And you mentioned tech there. You can, you know, go to GoDaddy, Bluehost, whatever. You can sign up, get your own web domain for a couple of quid and you can get it hosted for another couple of quid and you've immediately got a shop front on the internet. Uh, You know, a few pounds more, you can uh, get some functionality to start selling things. It's all very easy and cheap to do. So for probably un- well under a hundred pound investment, you could have a really snazzy website that would uh, make people think that you maybe have more money than you actually do uh, as a shop front to the world. So these things don't cost a lot of money or don't need to cost a lot of money. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Michael, let's think then about putting ourselves in a position of a listener listening who wants to start their own business but doesn't really know where to start they've got a few ideas but they're not sure you know which one might be the best one to go with where would you advise that they uh what would you advise that they do process wise well what one of the first things to appreciate and you know again it, i guess entrepreneurship sometimes can be intimidating right so we hear about entrepreneurs we hear about ceos and and you can't quite um, uh, come to grips with all the various things that you have to do uh, as an entrepreneur. And by the way, there's a lot of things you have to do as an entrepreneur. Um, you need to have a very generalized skill set to be able to do a bunch of different things. Uh, but I guess, yeah, and one of the reasons I actually wrote, wrote this book was to sort of make entrepreneurship less intimidating. Uh, and the way I do that in the book is by having sort of three different parts or three different big things to think about. The first thing to think about is sort of your mindset, you know, generally how you approach a challenge and generally how you approach hard things. Uh, the second thing I talk about is sort of skills, uh, specific tangible skills uh, that you need to cultivate to become a better entrepreneur. Um, the third thing I talk about is the process of entrepreneurship, and I'll be able to expand on this uh, given given the question you've shared, uh, James. And you know the, the the process part is really about finding a way of identifying opportunities, finding a way of evaluating those opportunities, and and then finding a way of executing on those opportunities. Where do you start? Well, one of the best ways to start is not to come up with an idea, but to find a useful or at least to find a problem to solve in a useful way. Um, you know, there's a great uh, in- investor called Paul Graham who has a fantastic blog post about this, actually. And he talks about, you know, you don't want to go out there coming up with business ideas uh, when you're trying to start a company. You want to find an interesting problem to solve. Um, and there's lots of different things you can do to try and encourage that sort of mindset. Um, one of the things is just basically be uh, uh, very observant about the things um, around you. Uh, any problem that you come across, you can ask, well, 
how can we solve this? Or any solution you come across, you might ask, how can we change the status quo with this particular uh, issue? So, you know, what, one of the best things to do if you're thinking of starting a business is to immediately start asking, OK, what interesting problems are there for me to solve? Uh, what is broken about the way things work and what can we do to actually change things for the better? Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant example. And if you look at the look at a company like Uber, where, you know, the what was the problem? The problem was that taxi companies always lied to you about where the taxi was. You didn't know how much it was going to cost. They yeah, always said yeah. it was five minutes away when it was Absolutely. half an hour away. And, you know, it was a pain to pain to get hold of. And it was a problem for the taxi drivers as well, right? So they had irregular income streams, irregular customers. Uh, some customers would run off without paying. Yep. You know, there was a massive payments problem. Uh, so it was a two-sided problem in that in that instance. And you know, Uber came up with a, a fantastic solution to uh, to solve that particular problem, which is remarkably simple when you uh, when you think about it. And um, I remember reading an interview with the UK managing director um, of who launched Uber, and he said he couldn't believe that. The incumbent firms like Addison Lee in London didn't just mm. start their own app, you know, and do the same thing. And um, yeah, they had, uh, yeah, they launched a great product, and it's been it's been well liked by by people. So yeah, and that solved problems on both sides, as you mentioned. Absolutely, yeah, and 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 again, just going back to the principle around starting small and starting with a very basic idea. Um, I'm not sure if you read about the history of Uber actually, but they they started off as a as a premium limousine service that you would order on your mobile phone before they actually expand, expanded out to um to to have taxis and, and regular taxi drivers on the platform. So they you know they started with a very very small market in the US, focusing specifically on a on a very premium experience. Um, and it was only when that became uh, uh, successful and that started, started taking off that they actually went out and expanded their 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 business to have other taxi drivers on the platform as well. Mm. No, that's a good point. And yeah, as we said earlier, you know, you you never once you start something, you never know which direction you might end up uh, taking. So it's all about just just starting and putting your putting your ideas out to the world and seeing uh, seeing what bites. Absolutely, absolutely. And it'll be interesting to hear your, your perspective, James. Uh, when you started the Graduate Job Podcast, how, how did that sort of emerge and how, how did that evolve? No, so it's, it's, as you mentioned earlier about finding a problem. So the problem I had was that I um, was doing, uh, working, uh, helping with recruitment, uh, graduate recruitment. And I was, it was a couple of things. One, I was surprised at the gap in knowledge that was expected from you know our expectations as a consulting company where we expected graduates to be and um, the level of some of the graduates who were applying so i saw there was a big knowledge gap and then the other thing was um as a sort of go-to person for family and friends for applications and cvs and cover letters and things i found i was always telling people the same thing over and over again yeah yeah so I thought oh, I thought it was a good way to to share some of this knowledge and to you know to mm. help educate people and um, yeah the the podcast was born really coming up to six years ago so yeah it's been that's amazing uh, it's been, that is amazing it's been going a while but um, helped by brilliant guests like yourself so uh, <laughs> who, who bring the knowledge um, well, it's a great show no ah, thank you and um, for me it was a real passion project uh, launching the the podcast. Um, thinking about the business or a business specifically um how important do you think passion is is it important to be you know should you be passionate about what you do or is it more important to be passionate about making money in something that you yeah. might not be yeah. as interested in yeah well I, I, what's really what's really interesting is that sometimes the, the passion comes afterwards um you see passion is a little bit like motivation in some ways in the sense that you know have you ever sort of felt uh, you know very hesitant to do something but the moment you started to do it you know all of a sudden motivation came out of nowhere um you know passion in some ways is like that and you know i like to think about sort of steve jobs in in, in this instance um you know i appreciate his you know he's been overused as an example you know apple is a company that's overused as an example in entrepreneurship circles um so i do tie sometimes of using it a lot but you know steve jobs you, you know he if you read his autobiography there's a there's a rather not autobiography, a biography by, um, I think it's Isaac Walton. Yep. And he talks about how Steve Jobs initially just wanted to make money. He just wanted to make money, right? Um, he wanted to find a way of making money, and he got into this personal computer business, and that started to take off, and then he became very passionate about bringing amazing products to customers. 
Uh, but if you read the biography, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a, a sort of a section in the early parts of the book where, you know, it's quite clear that Steve Jobs wanted to find a way of making money. Uh, and actually, he was quite sort of ruthless in the way that he, he, he uh, operated commercially in terms of generating substantial uh, uh, financial returns for himself and, you know, eventually his company and his, his shareholders. Uh, but, you know, sometimes the passion comes afterwards. Now, of course, some people are born with an innate passion for something. Mm. Uh, I've got a really good friend of mine who was born uh and and you know you know from from a very 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 young age he wanted to be a pilot uh and he just practiced and practiced and practiced and now he's a commercial pilot and then i've got other friends who actually they you know it took them a little bit longer to find out what they were good at interestingly enough they actually became more passionate about a certain thing that they became good at after a very very long time so in the book i talk about having uh there's a there's a fit theory of passion uh, which talks about people who are looking for something they can just slot into and they've, you know, they've, they've got this innate passion for something and they're out there trying to discover it. And then you've also got the developed theory of passion, which talks about, you know, you become good at something first before you can actually become super excited about it and super passionate about it. So, you know, I would urge, you know, maybe, maybe some of the listeners to think about, OK, it's, it is possible to have a, uh, a specific thing that you might be passionate about. So maybe you want to start a business in uh, the fashion industry, maybe you want to start a business in the music industry. Um, you know, that might be a, a, an innate passion that you have. But I would urge sort of the listeners to also be a little bit more open minded. Right. You know, you might experiment with other things and it might take a while before something takes off, before you can actually all of a sudden become uh, more interested in it. But I think the Steve Jobs story is quite, quite interesting. And, uh, you know, it's definitely worth checking out the biography. And, yeah. and it's quite telling to see that, you know, early on, he was very motivated by money and then you know, this Apple thing took off and became an incredible company and it became very, very passionate about, yep. you know, being an entrepreneur, being a CEO and building amazing products. No, no. And um, Michael mentioned books there and uh, you definitely do need to check out his book, Graduate Entrepreneurship, How to Start Your Business After University. You can find uh, links to it in the show notes where will also be a full transcript, which today will be at graduatejobpodcast.com slash entrepreneurship. And speaking of books in it, the reading list is mightily impressive. You must have uh, read hundreds of books uh, to, yeah. to pull it together. So, uh, yeah, it's Michael is an extremely well-read man. Um, well, it, goes, it goes back to the passion thing, doesn't it? I mean, you know, sometimes if you're you know really, really curious about something, you end up spending a lot of time on it. And yep. oftentimes it doesn't feel like work. Um, but, you know, curiosity can be a very powerful motivator as well when you're sort of working through challenging things. No, definitely. And um, let's maybe dive into the topic of skills. Now, I recently had on um, the graduate recruitment manager for Capgemini um, a couple okay. of episodes ago, um, talking about the graduates they, they're looking for and how to apply for Capgemini. Right. And it's interesting. One of the things he, he talked about was just how interested they are uh, to find out about applicant side hustles. Mm -hmm. So whereas some listeners might think they need to sort of shy away from that at capgemini they were really interested they wanted to know if you've started a business they want to know if you've still got a business because they see the benefit that you bring as a candidate having having done these things having started your business and yeah. you know they were happy that you'd um because they well, dan doherty in the episode talked about how the majority of people with side hustles you know, they, they don't want it to be permanent. They're just happy for it yeah. to be sort of ticking on in the background. But mm. Camp Gemini, they really saw the benefit of what you could bring from uh, from starting a, a side hustle. In your experience, you know, do you think side hustle or having a side hustle is a good way for a, a listener to maybe get introduced to graduate entrepreneurship and, and starting their own business? Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's a really. In fact, it's great to hear that some recruiters and, and some companies are very open minded about this. I think you know anything that can cultivate an inter entrepreneurial mindset, you know, can be a very very powerful way of 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 upskilling yourself and and, and making yourself uh, more useful to other people, right? Uh, you know, what is career success? Career success is having someone who's very useful to other people, right? Um, so I think you know side hustles. You know, that, you know, may, maybe we can find another name for it at some point. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it's 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 a way of cultivating key entrepreneurial skills, right? Because if you're doing something on the side, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a newsletter, whether it's a YouTube channel, um, you know, whether it's a, a food business, um, you're thinking about strategy. How do you create an advantage for yourself? You know, you're thinking about branding. How do you make something that's memorable 
and, and easy to remember and easy to associate with. You're thinking about sales. You know, how do you convince people to part with their money uh, so they can they, they can get value out of what you're what you're uh, producing? Uh, you think about marketing. Right. How, how do you attract and, and, and retain customers? All these skills are actually very, very important, regardless of what career you pursue. Yep. Uh, in fact, if you look at some of the, uh, the, the the top businesses in the world, the FTSE 100 companies, or you look at any 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 successful company and you look at their senior team, a lot of people in the senior team will have some entrepreneurial experience, or certainly at least they'll have one of the skills I've just spoken about, and they'll have a huge depth of experience in that particular category, whether it's strategy, whether it's marketing, whether it's sales, uh, whether it's branding, or, or whether it's finance. You know, these are all key skills that can be cultivated with with a side hustle uh, and and through entrepreneurship as well. Ah, oh, completely. And you know, if you were to start a business after university, spend a couple of years on it, and then decide you want to get a graduate job, then you're going to have a couple of years of such brilliant experience. You're going to have so many answers to competency questions coming out your ears Absolutely. in terms of you know difficulties you've been through things you've learned marketing yeah. skills sales skills communication skills it's going to really make you stand head and shoulders above uh, other applicants who who maybe are just applying straight out of university who haven't got that so Absolutely. Um, and 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 it could take off it could take off and yep. it could turn into an incredible company right i was just reading about the founder of gymshark um yeah. he started it as a side hustle um and you know, fortunately for him, you know, it just took off amazingly well. And, and now it's a, it's a multi, uh, it, it's a, it's a billion dollar business, right? So that started as a side hustle and, and grew into something incredibly, incredibly successful. But of course, you know, entrepreneurship is very hard and, you know, starting something new can be challenging. Uh, but as you were saying, James, actually, um, even if the company doesn't work out, there's a lot that you can learn from something that hasn't been as successful. Yep. Um, in fact, sometimes we actually learn more from things that don't work out than from things that actually take off and become incredibly successful. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's worthwhile thinking about starting something, even if it's small, even if it doesn't make a lot of money. Uh, it can be a really, really powerful way of putting into practice those key skills that can help you throughout your career. You know, strategy, marketing, sales, branding, finance. These are things that you want to cultivate regardless of what industry or career that you're going into. Definitely. And that is probably, with time running away from us, is probably a great point for us to finish the main part of the interview on before we move on to the weekly staple questions. So let me put you on the spot, Michael. We talked about books earlier. What one book would you recommend that listeners should read? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, so I, I, I tend to read a lot and I'm, I'm always sort of recommending books depending on where people are um, uh, at their, you know, in, in their particular circumstance. I think, you know, the Steve Jobs biography is probably a pretty good book to read. Um, I think I would highly recommend that just so you can actually so people can see how the entrepreneurial process uh, evolves over time so i think that that would probably be a great uh, biography to read and, and, and it's a fun read as well it's quite fun to read that story so it's uh quite a quite an easy 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 read oh definitely and uh, i will link to that in the show notes so a uh, good recommendation there so next question michael what one website or internet resource would you point listeners towards uh, so I think, you know, for someone who's just coming out of university and and, and perhaps thinking about what to do next, um, you, you know, you probably want to read from lots of different places. Um, you want to read various websites that can really help you have a, a, a good understanding of the world commercially. Um, so I'm probably going to be quite boring and, and uh, encourage, you know, readers to read a substantial newspaper so maybe the financial times uh you know fairly boring but i think it gives you um it, it, you know it gives you a sense of where the world is going uh mm. from a economic perspective and sometimes from a political perspective as well so you know maybe perhaps a bit boring but i think it's uh it, it's good to sort of have some commercial awareness and, and the ft is, is, is quite good for that definitely and um yeah, if you're used to just reading the metro or the free evening standard it's um yeah the standard of journalism is uh much improved in the ft so get yourself a, a cheap yeah. uh student subscription and you uh you won't regret absolutely it. and even if you just flick through the headlines and then google the story elsewhere there'll be another publication that covers that particular story yep. um so you know what i used to do sometimes i would just flick through the headlines and find the uh the, the story or another sort of free website to read from 
Ah, that's, uh, I like that tip. That is uh, that is a good one. Um, so final question today, Michael. What is one tip that you'd recommend that listeners can implement today to help them on their job search? So I think learning how to learning how to really think about your your, your what you're what you're hoping to achieve uh after university really thinking through what you want to achieve in life really and, and, and maybe this is a a very uh fuzzy uh fuzzy tip but you know i would say take some time to think about what you want to achieve in life um you know you know, fairly fairly cheesy but i think Shortly after university, you know, it's a very transitional moment. It's a pivotal moment in your life. So I think it helps to just think about, you know, from a big picture perspective, you, what would you like to achieve? Um, of course, you know, plans change. And, you know, especially now that we have COVID, the, you know, the world has sort of evolved in a, in a very unexpected way. But, you know, if I was to give one tip, I would say, you know, try and think about where you want to be in, you know, maybe three years, perhaps, and work your way backwards from that in terms of what you need to do. Um, so if it's a particular industry you want to work in, you know, look for ways that you can accelerate your, your journey by putting in a lot of work now and hopefully in three years time you can get there. Uh, and by the way, you know, if any, any of the listeners uh, are interested in venture capital, um, I'm, I'm very easily accessible on LinkedIn and Twitter. And I'm always happy to answer questions about that and, and provide some guidance on, on, on how you can uh, tackle your entry into the venture capital industry. Brilliant. That was going to be my next question. What was the best way that people can get in touch with you? But you've um, any? Have you still get your website, or is it just mainly yeah, so Twitter and LinkedIn? I've got a website. I've got a website, MichaelTefula.com. Um, very easy to reach on Twitter. Uh, so my DMs uh, are always open. Uh, so my Twitter is MichaelTefula. Uh, I'm also easily accessible on LinkedIn. So I've got a pretty, you know, pretty much accept all. I accept all LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn connections um, and you know, try, I try to get back to people as quickly as I can as well. Excellent. And I have to say, um, Michael is a really insightful person to follow on Twitter. He's always uh, posting interesting articles. Uh, so especially if you're interested in the world of venture capital, there's uh, lots of uh, really interesting articles uh, that Michael posts. So make sure you uh, you do check him out on Twitter. And all the links to everything we discussed today will be in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash entrepreneurship. Michael, thank you so much for appearing on the Graduate Job Podcast. And yeah, hope to get you back next year with your new book. Thank you so much for having me, James. It's been a blast and uh, you know, I look forward to uh, doing another one. Many thanks again to the brilliant Michael Tafula for coming back on the show and sharing his insights. Isn't he a superstar? Of course, this podcast, as you can tell by the name, is dedicated to helping you find your dream graduate job. But a graduate job and working for someone else isn't going to be right for everybody. And in that case, starting your own business could be the way to go. And as we said during the episode, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing affair. You can start small and see where it goes. Start a little passion project on the side like I did with the podcast and see where it ends up. The skills you will develop on the way will impress recruiters no matter what type of companies you decide to apply to. And you never know, you might even end up with the next big thing on your hands. Now, don't forget, no matter where you are on your job search, I am here and able to help. Whether it's one-on-one, -on one-off coaching to get you prepped for an assessment center, practice mock group exercises, through to my flagship howtogetagraduatejob.com online course, I've got something for you. Getting a graduate job is so much easier if you aren't struggling by yourself. I've helped coach hundreds of people to get the graduate job of their dreams, and I'll be able to do the same for you. So check out graduatejobpodcast.com slash entrepreneurship where you can find links to my coaching, the online course and how you can book on upcoming mock group exercises. Don't be a stranger and make sure you do get in touch. And also a final request from me. If you've enjoyed the show today, please can you like and leave me a review wherever you downloaded it. It helps to keep me high in the rankings and for people to find the show and I will be forever grateful. So that is everything from this week. Join me in two weeks time on Sunday when I have the brilliant Bruce Tulgan on the show. It's a goodie. I hope you enjoy the show today. More importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you in two weeks.